everybody. Welcome to Mermaid Hill Vineyard. Uh, my name's Nico. I'm here uh, working here as the wine grower. Uh, it means I grow the grapes here. Uh, we also produce wine here at uh, our winery just uh, on the other side of the vineyard here. Uh, we are growing organically, uh, which is uh, the only vineyard in New Hampshire practicing organic grape growing. Uh, we have two acres uh, under vine of the Grape Marquette, which you can see here. Uh, this is a red grape uh, that is coming from the University of Minnesota. We also have uh, a quarter acre of white grapes that are just down there. Uh, the two varieties there are Lacadie and Itasca. Uh, all of these grapes are what are what known as uh, hybrid grape varieties. So uh, a hybrid grape is a cross between European grape DNA uh, as well as Native American grape DNA. So um, in this case with the Marquette, Pinot Noir is providing the European DNA, gives that really kind of familiar wine taste to the grape. Um, however, about 60% of the genetics are coming from wild grape varieties, um, Vitis riparia, and Vitis avestialis are some of the main uh, grapes in their lineage. Um, the reason that's important is the American DNA allows these grapes to survive our really cold winters here. Uh, and without that, the, just if we planted Pinot Noir, for example, that would die um, because it's so cold. So these grapes have a really interesting lineage. They were developed uh, using old school breeding techniques by the University of Minnesota. It takes about 20 years to develop a variety like this. Um, when it's all said and done. Uh, and these grapes kind of have this feeling of being both wild and cultivated um, because they have that wild DNA and that kind of cultivated DNA in them. So in our agriculture here, we seek to balance the wild and the cultivated elements. Um, we are, uh, as I said before, making our own wine here as well. Um, that's why I use the term wine grower. It's somebody who grows the wine. Uh, so we, use only the grapes that we harvest uh, from this vineyard that we farmed ourselves. That allows us to really uh, take care of our plants the way we want to and make sure that the quality of the grapes going to the wine is extremely high. Um, we are selling the wine here during the weekends on tasting. So we're doing uh, Saturday and Sunday uh, appointment by uh, appointment tastings, um, coming through for people to come have a visit, uh, have a taste, take a tour. Um, and we're also selling in a few markets, so Werner Public, Public Market uh, down at uh, the Concord Co-op, and we're working on getting into a few restaurants right now. Revival is the main restaurant that carries our wine. So Mermaid Hill has been in operation uh, since 2016. Uh, the current ownership took over in 2018, and that's when uh, we made the transition to farming organically. Um, Prior to that, the vineyard was conventionally managed. Uh, there's a lot of Roundup being sprayed both on and underneath the vines. Um, and when it was taken over in 2018, there's actually so much dust here that you couldn't mow the lawn without wearing a dust mask. Um, there's that much bare soil and earth. Um, and so in 2018, uh, made the choice to convert to organic agriculture. And we're still in that conversion process, um, probably for the next five years or so, I would say, um, until we can really bring this ecosystem back into balance. Um, so when we're talking about what we do here, we're really focused on uh, a holistic type of farming that's not just farming the grapes, um, but is paying attention to what's growing under the grapes, what's growing in between the rows, what's growing in the buffer zones between the vineyard and the forest, um, and managing all of those, including managing the forest itself and uh, working to remove invasive species, um, especially bindweed uh, and some, a lot of bittersweet actually, um, mitigating that uh, from invading the vineyard. Um, this holistic approach is something that I learned uh, in my internship for two years with a biodynamic wine grower in Vermont. Um, what is really important to, to say is that biodynamics really encourages uh, an individual to learn exactly what a site needs. And uh, rather than being a prescribed list of rules or regulations that you must follow, the, the idea is that you instead read the landscape and learn from the landscape um, about how you might want to interact with that landscape and farm uh, in a way that's being sensitive to the other needs of the landscape other than just your crop. Uh, so uh, what, what I've learned in this vineyard here is that there are distinct zones of the vineyard. Um, 
each zone has a different soil quality, gets a different amount of sunlight. Um, and that's actually broken down into probably, I'd say, almost 10 distinct zones in my own mind, um, which is will probably increase with time as I learn more about the site. Um, but in terms of a vineyard site uh, here in New Hampshire, um, we have really good soil for growing grapes. Most of the soil is well-drained, sandy loam, um, and grapes love that because they don't like to be around a lot of wet. Um, the number one challenge we deal with here is uh, fungal disease on both the leaves and the shoots as well as the berries. Uh, and we manage that fungal disease uh, as part of our ecosystem management. So we mow when we think we need to mow to take some moisture out of the soil um, to increase air flow through the vineyard. So we did have a wet patch right in the beginning of July when we finally got some rain. Um, and that's when I made the decision to mow all of the rows. So everything was unmowed up until then and hasn't been mowed since, since it's been dry since then. But mowing at that time, right after a lot of rain, um, really helped take some moisture out of the soil and force the vines and the grass to suck up more of that moisture, um, reduce the amount of humidity in the vineyard, but it also allowed for better airflow down the row. So especially as we started to get into uh, July where the days were hot but the nights were cool, we'd allow some of that air to drain down the rows a little bit easier. Um, so that's one example of, of the way that we're, we're using the, the landscape to manage the plants without actually doing anything to the vine itself. Um, keeping that in mind, we want to keep the, the landscape in a, in a kind of balance. So we do allow uh, some of our, the flowers that we really like to stay and go to seed. Um, so this year we've made a really concerted effort. Uh, towards that. Um, the, the advantage to that is that, like I mentioned, all that dusty bare earth, there's still a lot of that, even where I'm standing, um, you know, everything isn't completely covered by something living. Um, so, you know, part of our management strategy is around allowing things to go to seed, um, increasing the biodiversity here as well. Let's head into the vines and uh, take a closer look. All right, so welcome to the Old Vineyard. Uh, this is the oldest planting here at uh, Mermaid Hill Vineyard. It was planted in 2012. Uh, that was the first year that the Marquette grape was released. Uh, so these are the oldest vines that we have and will ever have of this grape. Um, one of the things I wanted to talk about here was the life cycle of the grapevine um, throughout the year. Uh, so right now we're in a period that's really special. It's called Veraison. Uh, as you can see here, we've got some bunches that are uh, starting to turn color. And once we see this, uh, we know that we're getting ready to harvest. Um, we harvest once a year. It typically happens at the uh, beginning of September, late September, sometimes on a really cool and wet year, kind of like last year, that might be all the way uh, into the first week of October. Um, but this year has been really hot and dry. The plants have received a lot of sunlight, um, really good growing conditions actually. Um, so we're seeing this pretty early, this change in color here. Um, so after we see this change in color, um, we're starting to think about harvest. What's going on with the plant though, um, is the plant is starting to recognize that winter is coming. It's time to start to ripen the fruit. Um, and we see the plant put more energy into the ripening process here um, by pushing tannins and phenols into those grape berries um, that cause them to turn that red color. That color will continue to deepen um, up until harvest. And uh, the plant will also limit the amount of vegetative growth that it does. Um, and so the, the plant is really focusing on reproduction, so making those fruit um, ripen and be attractive to birds, which soon will be netting this so they can't get them, and to us so we can make wine that's very attractive. Um, and the, as I said, the plants are starting to balance how much vegetative growth, they're starting to stop that. Um, and the way that we can tell is we can see uh, here on this stem that there's a little bit of red starting to develop on the stem. Um, that's starting to harden off. It's starting to put more lignans into the stem, uh, into the shoot to start to make it um, become much stiffer and get ready for winter to overwinter safely. Um, and we're seeing that in all of the shoots. The leaves also get a little bit thicker and tougher um, as they're getting ready to uh, get ready to ripen that fruit. And that, that toughness of the leaf, the lignification of the stem, the tannins, and the phenols going to the berries, those are all ways uh, for the plant to protect itself from disease. So this, at this point, um, August 5th, 
you know, we're in a really good spot where the plant is almost, I won't say immune, but it has a really good self-defense against any of those fungal diseases that we talked about before. Um, so as the plant's getting ready to harden off, um, you know, it's getting ready to ripen. We, then let's say we get to a month from now, fast forward, we're out here, we're picking the grapes, we're getting ready to make the wine just over there. Um, the plant will continue to, to ripen uh, its stems, it'll continue that hardening off process. Um, and then it will go into a dormant stage, um, usually right before the first snowfall. And all the leaves will drop off and the vineyard will look essentially dead uh, for about, uh, probably about four months here, let's guess this year. Um, and during that time is when we'll start pruning. So I'll take a month off and then starting in January, um, we'll start pruning the vines. We take between 80 to 90% of all of the plant material that grew the prior year off the plant. That hard pruning really encourages the plant to produce fruit next year. Um, so that pruning is happening basically January to March. Um, late March, early April, we'll start to see the first signs of bud burst. So the buds will start bursting. Um, and then we'll start to see shoots develop soon after that. Um, and then we're really into the bulk of our farming season, especially early spring, early summer is when we're working to make sure the plants have enough protection from those fungal diseases I mentioned before. Um, the way that we're doing that here is spraying. Um, we're using only earth minerals, so copper and sulfur are the only things that are sprayed on the plants. Um, we're not using anything derived from petroleum products in our management of these plants at all, um, aside from the diesel used in the tractor that, is, that has the sprayer on it. We also make our own sprays here uh, from plants that grow in the vineyard and on the surrounding property. Um, so that's part of the biodynamic practice where we're reading what the landscape gives us and we're incorporating that into uh, our program here to help the plants feel more at home in their environment. Um, what you see here is daisy fleabane. Um, this plant is uh, an antifungal plant. It grows here abundantly, especially in this section. Um, and this section also gets a good amount of moisture. Uh, the drainage isn't super good. And so when I saw that growing here and thought about the amount of moisture, I realized that the plant was trying to say, hey, you need some antifungal in this space because of the amount of moisture. Um, so we made a tea with that, a decoction. Uh, we sprayed that in this section and other sections of the vineyard. Um, that's one example of what we incorporate. We also use stinging nettle. Uh, we use horsetail early in the season. Uh, we also use a few other plants experimentally. So yarrow, alder buckthorn, um, and this year I also experimented with some dandelion tea. Um, so we're, we're reading the landscape, we're testing those out, um, and we're using them as this practice that, that uses the landscape within uh, how we farm um, and helps the vines feel comfortable where they live. So these vines have a lot of, as I mentioned at one point, um, native grape DNA. Those grapes uh, like to live on the edges of forests, riverbanks. Um, we try to mimic that habitat as much as we can. Um, and here we have, you know, you can see the, the ground cover is allowed to live. It's only been mowed one time. Um, we also allow the plants, the vines themselves, to grow as they want to. Um, we don't trim them at all. We don't water them at all. We allow them to be fully expressive. And you can see they're kind of, uh, they're jumping. They're, they're growing in every which direction. They're exploring all these avenues about how they might want to live. And um, something that we, we believe really strongly in here is that expressiveness. And this is what's, the example of that is this. Um, this is known as the apex bud here. It's the, it's the leading edge of a cane that goes out um, from the plant and it explores its environment. And the way it does that is with these tendrils, which are uh, at the opposite of each leaf internode. Um, these actually move in a spiral pattern looking for something to grab onto. When they grab on, they grab on tight. They wrap themselves around, they pull the plant to it. Um, all conventional, conventional wine growers cut these off um, and they do that because the plant's getting too big. Well, the thing is, this is actually the way the plant senses whether it's getting too big or not. So if you cut this off, the plant's going to start growing really fast because it's going to freak out. Oh shit, somebody cut off my, you know, my sense organ, like I'm under attack, I need to expand my vegetative reach, right? Um, so they're actually in this never-ending battle against constantly cutting the plants, bent the plants back. The vine's constantly growing larger, um, but if you allow the apex bud to do its job, which is to, to know its environment, to know where it is, um, the plant finds its own balance. And you see in this, this shoot, it's not overly long. It's long enough, um, it's healthy, and it's going to be there to ripen the grapes, and all the leaves will be able to do that. So um, 
you know, that's one example of how we listen to what the plants do. And we also trust the plant's intelligence. I mean, the, the genetics of this plant are, or have been evolved over thousands and thousands of years to be able to adapt to almost any climate. And so any growing situation. And so there's, there's, no, there's not a lot of place for me to say, oh, well, you don't need this anymore. There's a reason the plant has evolved to have this. Uh, and I think it's quite beautiful uh, to look in the vineyard and to see things you know, jumping and growing. And uh, it brings this kind of magic into the vineyard. And so I really believe that vineyards create their own magic. Uh, and that magic, it gets into you. All right, so uh, here we are down in the lower part of the vineyard. Uh, these are the second oldest vines that we have uh, in the whole entire vineyard. And I uh, really like this area, especially this time of day uh, when the sun kind of declines and uh, filters through these vines here. And uh, there's a feeling of being surrounded by the vines, uh, a feeling of capturing some sort of moment in time. And when we think about wine, that's really what wine is doing is we're trying to capture what the whole entire growing season was like in one bottle. Um, and that's a, it's a really nice way to think of wine, especially from the growing perspective, because as I'm out here working with the plants every single day, um, walking the rows, looking for diseased berries on, on fruit or looking for diseased leaves with that fungal disease we're pulling off, um, doing all that work by hand, you really start to get a feeling for what it's like to be a vine, um, what, it, what different parts of the vineyard feel like for that vine to grow in. Uh, and down here, I feel like they're very jubilant and kind of wild. Um, and you can see that almost that, that wildness is uh, expressed in how ripe these berries are here. So, I mean, this, this is the, the same, same variety as uh, we saw before, but um, substantially more ripe. Um, and they're starting to swell up and get that beautiful uh, deep purple color here. Um, and part of that learning about what the plant likes to, uh, when it grows and the different sections of the vineyards is, um, is part of what it's like to be working in perennial agriculture. And, um, really starting to develop a relationship with the land and the vines themselves. Um, these vines every year get touched by human hands at least 10 times, every single vine. Um, that's from the pruning, which is all done by hand, to the leaf pulling, to the tying of the canes, um, onto the trellis to give them support, um, to the removal of disease, um, and just to the curious eye as we walk to say, what is this new bug? What is this new, uh, this new spot on the leaf? Um, how are the berries doing? How are the bunches developing? Um, there's this real feeling that in this work, uh, connection with the land and with the vines starts to emerge. And, and it becomes almost like a dialogue where each year you, you try to understand how the plants are growing. You try to capture that in that bottle of wine. And then the next year, when you're going to prune, the plant says, this is how I grew last year, and this is what I liked and I didn't like. And then I respond and I say, okay, I'm gonna give you what you liked and prune this part of you this way and this part of you that way. Um, and then the next year it grows and it, it gives me feedback. And over time, a relationship really develops that uh, is wonderful. And in this work, which is hard work, as any organic farmer knows, uh, I think it's important to take the time to step back and recognize the beauty and the wonder that is part of farming, that is part of developing relationships with plants um, and the environment in which they live, um, and how that relationship with them helps us be better people um, and helps us explore every avenue uh, in which to live, much like these plants do. So the uh, final stop in our tour is the winery. This is where we do all the work in transforming our grapes into wine. Um, the way that we do that is basically the way that old Italian peasants would do it. Um, we use really simple technology in that to, to get that transformation to where we want it to be. Um, so we do all foot stomping of the grapes. Uh, so actually we harvest them, we take them off the stems, um, and then we stomp them. Um, and that's a really great way to extract all of the, the wonderful flavor and color and aroma from those grapes. Um, then we use a wooden basket press to press those grapes. Um, this is a really traditional way of doing it. It provides a really slow um, and even pressing uh, of the grapes so that we don't over extract them, but we uh, make sure we do get um, as much as we can from them. Um, after that, we have juice that's fermenting, and then that goes into a number of different places depending on the wine we're making. Um, so we use glass carboys, much like this one here. Um, 
We also use these glass demijohns, uh, which are a really old classic shape in winemaking. Um, these are uh, these were developed uh, by a glass blower back in the 1400s, um, and they do a really wonderful thing during the fermentation of the wine, um, where they actually create a spiral where um, the fermentation is constantly pulling the yeast back up to the top and then pushing it back under a really dynamic fermentation. Uh, something that we're doing here that's a little bit experimental is working with flex tanks in winemaking. So um, we do employ traditional barrels as well, um, but these tanks here are crafted from a food grade type of plastic that allow breathability um, in the wine without importing any of the wood taste from a barrel. Um, and these are, we really like these because they're much more cost effective than using a barrel, um, but they also provide a really unique texture um, and complexity to the wine um, without adding any other flavors. So when we think about wine, we're really trying to capture that growing season that the grapes grew in and uh, really maximize the grape taste in the wine rather than adding anything to that wine or taking any away, anything away from that wine. Um, so that means that we're only working with the wild yeast that are on the grapes when they come in to start the fermentation. Um, and we're not adding any preservatives, color additives, any of the, none of the 500 legal additives to wine make it into our wine here. Um, that's again to really capture what it was like to be that grape during that growing season. Um, the rest of the space is a little bit in progress right now. Uh, part of my uh, mission here is to use appropriate technology for the winemaking. So there's a few relics from the past that are here, but uh, in general, we're working towards uh, creating a winery that is completely solar powered. Um, we're doing that through solar panels on the house. We'll be adding some more to the roof here, um, really trying to be conscious of how we're getting the energy that we're using to make this wine. Um, that's really about it. Uh, that's, this is where I'd end the tour. And if you were here with me in person, I would offer you a glass of wine and we would drink one together. Uh, I can't do that, but I can show you at least what it would look like and what I would open for you. Uh, so this is our 2018 uh, red wine made from all of our grapes here. Um, it's really bright and fruity and would be great to drink on this hot day. Uh, so come by sometime and open one up and let's hang out. Cheers. Thank you.